Thank you, ladies. I'll be reading today from uh, Paul's letter to the church of Corinth. I'll be starting at verse 3, and I'll be reading, uh, or I'm sorry, chapter 3, and I'll be reading verses 5 through 9. After all, what is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants who helped you to believe. Each one had a role given to them by the Lord. I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Because of this, neither, one, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But the only one who is anything is God who makes it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together. But each one will receive their own reward for their own labor. We are God's co-workers and you are God's field, God's building. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, you've heard the phrase, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. God is good right? I'd be honest with you, I don't like that phrase. I never have, because there's an awful lot of people that don't understand what God is good means. You know, they're kind of under the impression that God is good only when good things happen to me. But what about the terrible loss I just suffered? What about the tragedy? What about the struggle I have that won't go away, right? To a seeker, I think that term, God is good, is kind of exclusive, you know? So, Last year, a course of study, lo and behold, how God kind of uh, works in our lives, whether we are aware of it or not, one of the, uh, actually he was the director of the school, preached a sermon the very first day I was there. And he shared the same thing I just did with you, and he said, you know, I don't like the phrase, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is, God is good. good. And pretty much for the same reason. But then he told us about a mission trip that he had recently gone on with his church to Haiti. And it was after the hurricane, or the earthquake came first, right? Didn't it? They had the earthquake and then the hurricane, right? And I mean, it, it wiped out these people. You know, hundreds of thousands of people were, were you know, homeless. Uh, thousands were killed. People were missing. Families were separated. Their economy was devastated. They were starving, right? All of, all of this depravity. And he goes down there for this mission trip, and he goes into this church, and the preacher gets up there and he yells, God is good. And all of the people in this church in Haiti yell back all the time, God is good. And he started to really think, and then he started to, to really, it really moved him that in the midst of all of this trouble that they were facing, that these people were able to shout that back with enthusiasm, and it made him start to think. And he likes the term, God is faithful, right? Start to think about that in our language and how we understand of the word good and understand the word faithful. So if I was to yell out, God is faithful, anybody out there? All the time, God is faithful. That puts a little more substance to our faith, does it not? Because God is faithful all the time. And that doesn't really separate folks who don't really know what we're talking about when we do that. You know, just think of it, if we did that every Sunday here and we had a visitor and I yell out, God is good, and you all yell back all the time, right? It's kind of like, well, what are they doing? They're a cult. They're kind of weird, you know? But if I yell out, God is faithful, that gives you all a chance and a doorway to really open up to them and talk to them later. Because in the midst of your good times, in the midst of your bad times, in the midst of your horrible loss, God is faithful all the time. Most people come to Christ because of the witness of others. A few have found Christ by other means, and that's, that's great. It doesn't matter how you find Christ. But most of us have come to Christ because of the witness, the testimony of another. So this church in Haiti, after they would say, God is good, right? 
and they would yell back, you know, all the time, and all the time, God is good. Do you know what the people in Haiti would do? They would put up their hand and say, I am a witness. Right? Think about those people in their situation saying those words and then putting up their hands and saying, and I am a witness. Well, now, of course, the study, of course, after he shared that sermon with us, you know, he did that every morning. He was the director, so in his, his introduction to the class, he would say, God is good. And then all the time we would say, and all the time God is good. And then everybody in the class, we would just raise our hand and say, I am a witness. So we're talking about sharing our faith. We're talking about being the witness. In the gospel reading that Diane just read, that is at the very end of Luke. There's only a paragraph left beyond what she just read. And God, Jesus is telling us we are the witnesses. So let's think about witness, the, the word witness in our language, right? If somebody is on trial or if there's a, you know, a, a court proceeding, what do we rely on? We rely on witnesses, right? Now, you have expert witnesses. You have, uh, you know, hearsay witnesses sometimes that are allowed. But what is, what is given the most, most prominence in a trial? The eyewitness, okay? The eyewitness, the person that saw it, the person that experienced, the person that was there is given the most prominence. And we rely on that witness, do we not? So when Jesus left his disciples and talked about those words, you are the witnesses in, in the end of Luke, he was telling them that it's up to you now to tell the truth. It's up to you to spread the kingdom of God. You are the witnesses. And as a witness, you need to testify. So God is faithful all the time, right? all the time. God is faithful. and I am a witness. Right? We've been looking for signs for, you know, a month now or so. When, when did Easter? It's two months ago, right? We've, I'm all messed up from course of study, but Easter was a while ago now. But we've been looking for signs that Christ is alive, Christ is real, God is in our lives. God is loving us. God is guiding us. We're looking for signs of the Holy Spirit. And we've been teaching ourselves and learning how to recognize those signs. And many of you are sharing those signs with me. And keep it coming because I think that's great. And through the, the witnessing of those signs, our faith is growing, is it not? So now it's time to testify. All right? Ouch. Now it's time to evangelize. Ooh, that's even a worse word, right? How about it's time to share our faith? We can do that, right? Everybody look at the back of your bulletin on the back page. This is something I hope that you will paste up on your refrigerator or your bathroom mirror or tuck in your Bible and the front page is a bookmark. Whatever is a place of prominence in your daily life. Because for two weeks now, I've been asking you to start rehearsing your faith story. What, what is your faith story, right? You know, not your life story, but your faith story. What are some things? What are some nuggets? What are some eyewitness or, or real-life witness accounts where you can say, and I am a witness that you can share with another person that is seeking Christ, right? And you know, I'd never ask you folks to go anywhere I'm not willing to go. So I'm going to go first, and I'm going to answer some of these questions for you. And to be honest with you, most of you don't know anything about me in reference to these questions, right? I've been here three, with, three years with you. I've shared my call to ministry. I've shared some of my struggles. I've shared some of my joys, but I've never answered these questions to any of you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a shot at it today. What Jesus Christ means to me. Well, Jesus Christ to me is my mediation to God. Okay? 
God has, you know, th this Bible and all of these, this proof of his steadfast love for us. And you look at the whole Old Testament, and I don't think I'm better than any of those people because I know that I'm not. And none of the, old, the, the people in the Old Testament were able to get it. None of them were able to, you know, live right with God and get in alignment. And Jesus Christ did that for me, because I'm taught he did it for you too, but for me, Jesus Christ did that. He showed me how to live under the love and the laws of God. Jesus Christ also didn't cover my sin. He took away my sin. And that enables me to approach God with joy. It enables me to feel the love of God because that sin is not separating us. Right? So what was my life like before accepting Jesus Christ? Well, I was pretty arrogant. I was highly competitive. I could chop down anybody with words, and I'd do it and then brag about it later. Um, gave, you know, I did a lot of volunteer work and gave a lot, but it wasn't for the right reasons. You know, it was to bring myself glory and not, not Christ glory. Uh, that probably best describes me before I accepted Christ. Uh, how I became aware that I needed Christ and how Christ meets my basic needs. And, and number four, I'm going to couple these together. Who influenced me the most to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior? Uh, when we had our first child, Daniel, who's in the back, Diane declared, we're going to find a church because I had beat feet, left church. I didn't want anything to do with church, especially the Methodist church. Look where I am now, talking about God's sense of humor, right? But when we had our first child, Diane had had enough and, you know, we're going to find a church. And we started going to the church behind our house, um, didn't really fit in. We started going to every Lutheran church in the county. Um, that's Diane's background, and I didn't fit in. Uh, I think the one church I did fit in, it was a small church like this. They were struggling, and I, I kind of fit in there, but Diane didn't like that one. So then one day, out of desperation, we stumbled into a Methodist church, of all places. And um, we were greeted by a, an elderly woman. Her name was Ruth, who later became a dear friend of ours. And um, she just integrated us right away, introduced us to other people, uh, introduced us to other kids, helped us assimilate you know, where to sit, how to sit, where's the bulletin, you know, those silly little things that you feel when you're a visitor somewhere. And, uh, you know, we loved the pastor right away because Daniel was not a good kid. He was, uh, he, he was, uh, he was ADD and uh, quite a terrorist. And, you know, the kid, he, we, we sat in the back pew and they had these big glass windows all the way across the back of the church in Sparta. So he stands up and he's banging on the glass right in the middle of the sermon, you know. And the pastor, instead of getting freaked out, he just said, oh, it's, it's so wonderful to have children here. And uh, he was serious, you know. So we were like, all right, this is pretty cool, you know, if, if uh, he did, he was, because we were mortified, you know. <laughs> but that was, I'm getting off track, but that's how we, um, how, we, we joined that church. I, I gotta wrap this up, but we, we ended up joining the Sparta United Methodist Church. And as a new member, they, they asked me to be on Staff Parish Relations Committee. And, uh, you know, it, Staff Parish is supposed to be a nice, well-rounded committee, and they wanted somebody new to the church on the committee. And at that time, the church had a youth program with a, a paid youth, youth person, and two camps were unfortunately starting to uh, set up. And in a church, and in most organizations, especially a church, when, when, you know, you have one camp over here saying, we want this, and this is the God's path for us. And you have another camp over here saying, no, we want this. This is God's path for us. That can be really terrible for a church. You know, it can re really divide people. Because once you're in the camps, you start shooting at each other. And, you know, you build barricades. And, you know, communication breaks down. And all the, all the, the stuff not of God happens. And this meeting was going to be a real head where they had a staff parish meeting. The, the, the old uh, youth group, they had had a ministry directed at kids who were deeply in trouble with drugs and alcohol, sex, and their, the youth group 
had done miraculous things helping kids through that. And the newer kids that were joining, though, they weren't in that. You know what I'm saying? They wanted to go in a different direction. Um, you know, these kids weren't into that to start with. So to go into a youth group where every week you had, we were talking about drugs and, and, you know, sex addiction and all of that stuff, it just wasn't a fit anymore. So they wanted to change direction. And, it, you know, it was, it was all good stuff, but it was making a terrible divide in the church. And this fellow, Roy Dunlap, who uh, I did get to know very well uh, afterwards, just stood up. And he led the meeting, and he started to talk to each and every individual in front of the group, and he let them each tell their story. Let them each tell why they felt the youth group should be in this direction. And then he valued their story, because it is. It's their story. It's their feelings. It's what they, you know, it, it's, it has value. It holds value. And he did that with everybody in the room. And then he just stopped and prayed. And I'd never seen a, you know, a real man just stop and pray in the middle of a meeting. And he prayed that the Holy Spirit would come and give us clear direction on which way the, the youth group was to go. And he, he prayed that we not ever hold, one and each, or hold bitter feelings towards each other because we don't agree at this particular time, you know. And it changed the entire outlook at the meeting. The people that were in this camp about, no, we have to stay the same. You know, this worked for us in the past with the drugs and alcohol. And, and the people who were saying, no, we need to change because we, we're heading in a different direction. They all started to see each other's point. And I'll tell you something. We walked out of there, one. And I was intrigued. I was intrigued. And Roy was a Christian man in every sense of the word. He remained, he's, he's moved, to, moved down to Florida now, but um, he was laity. He wasn't a pastor. He was laity. And I started to see in Roy something that I wanted. I started to see something in Roy that I could be. And I started hanging out with Roy. And I started, uh, actually, we, he was a lay speaker, and I became a lay speaker, and we started doing a lot of stuff together. And I spent a lot of time with Roy and his wife, Linda, through Walk to Emmaus and other things. And I'll be gosh darned, I'm a lot like Roy now. And I'm a lot like Roy because of that meeting. And I'm a lot like Roy because he taught me how to do it. He showed me how to be a Christian. And it came from somebody in the pews. It didn't come from the pastor. You follow what I'm saying? Roy would over and over again say, I would say, Roy, I want to be like you when I grow up. And he would over and over again say, uh, if I'm a Christian, I'm the least of all. But that's, um, I just covered up my, my note, but that's number four and five in my faith story. Who influenced me the most to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior? It was by far Roy, Roy Dunlap. How I came to trust uh, Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior it was a walk to Emmaus weekend. I was in my late 20s. It's about 19 years ago or so. And um, on the walk to Emmaus weekend, I've talked about that before. We even had Jamie come and give us a talk. There's 15 talks. And, uh, you know, over the course of the three days, the, the weekend starts Thursday night. And the lay director reads a prayer. And it's, it's actually a pretty long prayer, but it's, it's really well thought out. And in the prayer, it says, Lord, we pray for those who need this weekend the most. But then it says, we also pray for the ones who think they need it the least. Right? You know, I, I'm still arrogant. So, you know, the arrogance wasn't out of me just because I met Roy. I was only going on the walk to Emmaus weekend because Diane wanted to go. And, you know, our sponsor said, you guys should go as a couple, you know. So that, that was why I went. So I really started to think when I heard that prayer, for those of you who think you need it the least. Because I needed it the least, you know. I had, I had arrived. It was all good. Every, everything was uh, A-OK -okay in my faith journey. But this, the talks over the weekend, they do follow an outline. But do you remember when, Ga when Jamie gave her talk, right? That was highly personal, was it not? She was talking about changing the world, and she talked about 
you know, her call to mission trips, and she talked about her sister. You know, remember when, when it said uh, the writing on the shower door and all of that stuff? Right? The talks are deeply personal because the people giving them, they are witnesses, and they're telling their faith story through those talks. And, you know, not all of the 15 talks spoke to me, but a few of them did, and that's all it took. There was a special service on one of the nights, and, um, you know, the, the Walk to Emmaus weekend has a chapel in the morning and the evening, and this was an evening service. And for the first time in my life, I saw Christ in the faces of other people. And that blew me away. That absolutely blew me away. Because I never thought of Christ living in me or living in Lester or living in anybody else, okay? I always saw Christ as, you know, Christ. I never realized until that moment when I saw with my own eyes and felt with my own heart that Christ is in all of us. And it profoundly impacted me. It profoundly changed me. And that night, and the service was ending, I went up with uh, my table leader and another pastor, and I turned my life over to Christ. And I've never looked back. I've never looked back. And, you know, how I discover ways of serving in the name of Jesus in the, in the world, you know, my calling has changed over the years. You know, when I first started, I was lay speaking at Sparta, and then... Um, you know, we, we were, Sparta was at the time a, a, a place for lay speaking. We used to go all over the north of New Jersey. And um, we used to also go promoting the walk to Emmaus, um, the same thing. So we, we were gone a lot, you know, lay speaking in, in one form or another. And, um, but then our kids, we had all three kids, and Diane was going to church on Sunday most with, with three young boys all alone. And, you know, that was getting to be trying on her part, bless her heart. And, you know, your calling changes to match your situation. So then the Lord called me to teach Sunday school at the Sparta Church. And, you know, I came back, back from vacation, and all the Sunday school classes were filled except kindergarten. And I said, oh, my gosh, you know, that's not me. I, I'm older kids. You know, I relate well to older kids. I'm not, no way I'm teaching kindergarten. And, you know, I, I ignored it. And then I ignored it the second week. And then we dropped off, I don't know who was in the class that year. Was it Andrew? All right. And they're like, well, there's no class for your son next week because there's no teacher to step forward, you know. So I'm sitting in the congregation in church that Sunday, and the pastor goes, I know somebody here heard the call to be a Sunday teacher and hasn't answered. And he's scanning the congregation, and he's looking, and his eyes got fixed on me, and he just made this scowl with his eyebrow like he was able to do. And I knew he knew, you know. So I confessed, and I started teaching Sunday school for kindergarten of all ages, and I had a blast. My calling changed, right, from lay speaking to teaching kindergarten Sunday school. Um, you know, from there, you know, you have your callings change. I, um, when fire chief was coming up in Lafayette, um, I stopped teaching Sunday school and most of my other uh, church committees because it's such an overwhelmingly large commitment to be fire chief that I, you know, had to make room for that. And I had great success in those years as, as officer and fire chief, and we started an EMS, EMS squad through the fire department, and that, that spread to other towns. And, you know, God was with me through all of that. But then when I was done with that, I became involved with Boy Scouts, and I loved Boy Scouts. I, you know, I had more fun. I didn't think I'd ever leave Boy Scouts. I had such a good time you know, with those, those kids and as they grow up into men. But my calling had changed, you know. And then, uh, you know, through the ending years of Boy Scouts, I got the calling to, to serve you folks, and that was my biggest struggle ever. You know, I was the last person in the world I ever thought would be a, a pastor, you know. But that's how I have discovered ways of serving God through, through all of that. So I hope through sharing, you know, just some of my faith story, and, you know, you wouldn't use all of these if you're sharing your faith with somebody. You wouldn't use all of those questions. But it's my hope that you'll start to use these questions as a basis for forming your faith story. You know, what is your story? What, what part of your story will be meaningful to leading somebody to Christ, right? 
you know, that old, you know, silly adage, but it's not that silly, is make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ, right? The importance of that is our presence and our relationship with others. Because if we don't form a relationship with others, we're not going to be leading anybody to Christ. You know, we can go stand on the corner of 46 and say, you brood of vipers, read your Bible or else. Well, I, you know, that may work for a smallest of percentage of people, but in reality, you know, working in the garden with other folks and working with common sense for animals and, you know, some of the other mission things that we do, in more, more reality, working side by side with people, why we proclaim the name of who we're working for, that's more likely to lead somebody into Christ because we've taken the time for relationships. So we'll see if you guys were listening. God is faithful. All the time. All the time. God is faithful. And I am a witness. Okay? Don't forget the I am a witness part. Because if we don't say I am a witness, there's no story to tell. There's no further, you know, conversation that's going to take place. But when we stand up in the depths of our despair like those people in Haiti and say, I am a witness, right? That is a profoundly strong message for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, hear an amen?